Welcome to our review of Chronicles of Avell from Rebel Studios, who we have to thank for sending, sending us a review copy of this game. Note, in addition to talking about the base game, we will also be letting you know what you get with the Adventurer's Toolkit expansion and Heroes Treasure promo pack. So Chronicles of Avell was designed by Chemik Kowiak and features artwork from Bart Walme Kordowski. It was originally published by Polish manufacturer Rebel Studio in Poland and is coming soon to North America. Now, right now, you can find it up for pre-order at most Canadian online stores for a price around 50 Canadian or 65 for a bundle with the expansion promo pack and Meeple stickers. Now, it's this bundle that we're going to be talking about tonight because that's what we were sent. Now, oddly, I haven't seen this available on any U.S. sites as of yet, so it looks like it might be coming to Canada first. And I will say the expansion for the game is small, but useful enough that it's really probably best to get it in the bundle if you can. So in Chronicles of Avil, players take on the role of brave heroes attempting to defend the lands of Avil and the health stone from various monsters and the beast which will be summoned when a meteor crashes into the land. In this cooperative tower defense game, players will explore a hex map, defeat monsters, and equip their heroes using a unique bag-pulling mechanism that uses your sense of touch to help you get the items you want. This is all done in preparation for the end game, where the monsters will rush the castle. For a look at what you get in the box for Chronicles of Avell, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now over all the quality here is honestly top notch. Some of the best I have seen at a game targeted at families and younger kids. You've got two layered player boards, thick cardboard, clear rules, fantastic artwork, and a unique fantasy setting where all of the gods are moons. That all of this really makes this game stand out above many other family weight games. As you learn about the gameplay, you'll understand why the component quality mm -hmm. makes more of a difference than you might think. Now, how about you give us an overview of how to play Chronicles of Avel? All right, you start a game of Chronicles of Avel by building the map. This is done by first placing the castle and three set hex tiles around it, though they're in random order. But those three are always outside the castle every game. You then randomize the rest of the tiles and lay them out face down in a pattern based on how difficult you want the game to be. Now, the base game comes with a number of maps split over three different difficulty levels, with the expansion adding even more. You also pick what level you want the final fight to be by picking a meteor from strength one to three. Now, this is placed on the appropriate spot on the map. With both of these sliders, right, like two different things you can adjust, this gives you a really wide range of challenges and difficulty levels which makes this a great game to grow with. Mm -hmm. So if you've got little ones, you can start things off easy and the game can get harder as they grow. Or if you want to break it out for grown-up game night, you can dial it up for that. And once you got the board set up, players make their characters, which my kids think is the best part of the game. This starts by grabbing a character sheet and then drawing or coloring in your character. There are boy and girl presenting sheets, and they're pretty fleshed out, but easy enough to draw over with a marker or softer pencil. Next, you're going to name your character, which you can do on your own, but the game actually provides a die drop table with male and female sounding names. And this is actually the first time I think I've ever seen a die drop table used in a board game, and I love it. Finally, players can create heraldry for their characters. Now, I'm going to bet that a lot of listeners may not be familiar with what a die drop table is, as they are a bit niche, and as you <laughs> pointed out, rarely used in board games. Now, a die drop table is a graphical tool that allows the location of where the die lands to determine what set of values the number on the die represents. Now, once everyone's made their characters, you place the character sheet into the two-layer character board, which are designed to hold the sheet between the layers, as well as give players a place to store their health counters and equipment. Now, each character starts with five health and one gold and one pull from the item bag. Now, the item bag is a big part of what makes Chronicles of Avil cool. In the bag is a mix of helmets, shields, weapons, and potions, 
each type having its own unique shape. So a sword feels different from a helmet. Now, when you need to pull an item from the bag, you say a short chant that lasts about five seconds, during which you can feel around to try to find the item type you want. When the chant ends, you have to pull your hand out and you're stuck with whatever you got. This feel mechanic is one of the real fun mechanics of the game, mm -hmm. though I am certain there are going to be some folks out there who may find it challenging with certain forms of nerve damage or dexterity limitations that might impede this mechanic from working as ideally for everybody. Yeah, so be aware of that if you are looking to purchase this game, that touch is required to fully enjoy it. Now, your character board has room for one helmet, one sword, and one shield. Any excess equipment, gold, and potions need to be stored in your pack, which is another cool part of the game, because due to using a two-layer board, the pack is actually set into the board, and you can fit as much stuff into your pack as you can physically fit the cardboard tokens on the board without stacking anything. Like Tetris, but without regular shapes. Mm -hmm. These are more oblong, rounded forms than nice, neat cubes. Yes. Now, when done creating characters, everyone places their meeple on the castle and the game starts. Now, each round, players are going to take turns taking two actions. After all players have gone, the moon token advances towards becoming the new moon. With each advance, either monsters respawn or players gain one health. Once the token hits the end of the track, the game end game is triggered. Not the end of the game, but like the end game. Meteor token is flipped over. Some new monsters are going to spawn, and the beast is added to the board, which is a nice tall 3D token that you put out. Now, from this point on, at the end of every turn, every monster, including the beast, will advance towards the castle. If any of them get into the castle, the players lose. So in many ways, the sort of standard tower defense progression. You've mm -hmm. got your prep time, and then the monsters make their way in to test what you've built up. In now, the actions the players can take include resting to get two hearts back, moving one hex, revealing a new hex, uh, like flipping over a new hex if you move on to a face down one, attacking a monster that's already on a hex, or interacting with the hex they're on. And only two actions doesn't leave a lot of time to experiment when that meteor is on its way. Now, most hexes contain wandering monsters, and these come in two different difficulty levels, small and large, represented by how big the tokens are. Now, monsters are further split into three colors, which affect how the player's equipment works on them without getting into too much detail. Now, hexes without monsters include useful sites where you can take actions like buying items, which gives you a pull from the bag, selling items by putting them back in the bag and getting some coins, upgrading the items you already own, which makes them way more powerful, placing walls around the castle. Each wall will prevent one monster from moving into the castle once, buying traps you can use against the beast and more. And remember, it's a random layout, so you can only plan so much. Now, one rule I really like, and that adds to the family-friendly nature of this game, is that the monsters never attack the characters. It's always up to a player to initiate combat, and you can freely move around or pass monsters on the board. Now, this has the advantage of the game not requiring a GM player or any AI for the bad guys. Until the final round, they literally just sit there waiting to be attacked. And even in the final round, the only thing you need to do is they move one spot toward the castle every round and every move has to be closer. Think of it as them resting, waiting to be awoken by the meteor. It's actually pretty thematic. Yeah, totally true. Now, combat in Chronicles of Avil is dice-based and pretty straightforward. Every hero starts with two green dice used in combat. They can earn additional red attack dice, blue defense dice, or yellow magic dice through upgrading their equipment. Now, non-upgraded equipment earns players either automatic hits or defenses against a specific color of monsters, or re-rolls that can be used once per combat. Now, each baddie shows a set number of black or purple dice on them. When attacking, you roll all your dice and the bad guy dice together and check the results. Swords and claws do damage to the monsters or you respectively shields and broken swords cancel these out the magic yellow die also has a symbol that can count as either a sword or a shield now after all the canceling out is done you and or the monster take damage for any leftover swords or claws now each combat action allows you to fight three rounds of battle with the option to start stop at any point you can retreat after one roll or you can go through all three or you can fight two rounds it's nice that not you or the monster, but that you and the monster can mm -hmm. both be taking damage. 
it's combat, not just a single swipe of your sword. Yes. Now, players have five health and are stunned, not killed. There's no player death in this game. And wake up in the castle with no gold and short one piece of equipment, but have full health due to the health stone, the thing you're guarding in a vel. Now, monsters have set hit points on their chits, and damage actually carries over between attacks, which you don't see often in these fantasy games. Now, when a monster is defeated, it's removed from the board, and you get the reward shown on the token. These often include equipment pulls from the bag, but can also include gold or being able to upgrade your gear. So it's important your balance to want to attack versus your need to upgrade while you can before that meteor strikes. Now, play continues with players moving around, using sites, buying and upgrading gear, placing traps, fighting wandering monsters, etc., until the meteor crash happens. Now the focus shifts to defeating every monster on the board, including the beast, who starts off with a ton of health and uses every bad guy die in the box when fighting. If players manage to defeat all the baddies, they win. But if even one makes it into the castle, you lose. Well, now that we've got a good idea of how to play Chronicles of Avel, what did your family think of this cooperative board game? Well, Chronicles of Avel has been a hit since the first time it hit our game table. Every time has been enjoyable. Everyone who plays, including adults, seems to be hooked right away just by having to draw their characters in heraldry. But it's this part of the game that does lead me to my first complaint, and that's the character sheets. Now, you get a nice thick pad of these, but there are a couple issues. First, the sheets are only one-sided, and they swap between girls and boys. Girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. Well, this is great if you always want to play an even split of genders. When you don't, you end up having to tear off sheets just to get to the ones you want. Now, I know I have tons of double-sided score pads. I think a doodle dungeon with its huge map pad, and I can't imagine that it's that much more cost to print two-sided. And I'm really surprised they didn't do that here with the male-looking characters on one side and the female characters looking on the back. Or even better, why have male and female looking? Just go with androgynous characters on all the sheets, and then you don't have to worry about it. Indeed, it's certainly an odd choice. Any number of solutions could avoid this sort of waste. Now, the next problem is the amount of detail in the graphics already in the sheets. When reading the rules, I was expecting to see a faint outline or an armature to draw over. Instead, you've got a fairly dark, fully detailed character that are already all armored up. I didn't expect that at all. And everyone I played with has noted this would be so much cooler if it was much more open to customization. Now, that said, this is nothing a set of markers or heavy use of a pencil can't fix. I just thought it was an odd choice for a game that encourages you to, to draw your character. Um, I guess it, perhaps that they're allowing for a market that isn't quite as eager to draw in every details as your daughters certainly are. But it is sort of a, it, there, there's a balancing point and they, they mm -hmm. just went too far even for that market, I think. I think so, too. Like, it, like honestly, the way it's done, the rules should almost just say color your character because the character is pretty much done. But you know what? We had fun drawing over top. Now, once you do have your character drawn or colored uh, or you just name it, the rest of the player board system is brilliant. I love the way they created these two layer boards out of two separate pieces and how you put them together to hold everything in place. And more brilliantly is even the way they tied this into the inventory system or different types of equipment, slot specific into specifically shaped areas so they don't slide around. And you actually have to get everything to physically fit in your backpack to be able to carry it. Every game we played has had at least one player sitting there fiddling with their pack between turns, trying to fit in one more coin or that potion they just picked up. Indeed, I think the physicality of this game is its strongest standout mm -hmm. feature. Now, another aspect of characterization that we had more fun with than I expected is that die drop table. Now, this is a thin sheet of thin card, not paper, but card that you put into the box lid. Now, on it are the various constellations of Avel. Uh, you then drop a green and a black die into the box and look where they land. Now, each constellation has part of a character name tied to it for each side of the die. Now, the sheet for this is two-sided with male and female sounding names. And I honestly like this enough that I kind of want to steal it for other fantasy games. Like the next time we're going to start up a new character quest and hero quest, we're going to use this to name our characters. And I could even see doing it for Dungeons and Dragons or other RPGs, just stealing the dry, dry, die drop table from a vel to use in other games. It's interesting. And I actually went down a bit of a rabbit hole of die drop tables the other night. And it's sad to see them so underused. 
Yeah, uh, there, there's something I, I learned about back in the Google Plus days, and Dyson Logos was making a bunch of them. So I am a huge fan of dry drop tables, and I love seeing them for use here. Now, as for the actual gameplay, it's engaging right to the end. And I really enjoy the mix of exploration, preparation, and battles. The only thing that feels just a bit off is how little you can do in one turn, especially with movement only being one hex. You're going to find that many turns are spent moving just so you can do something next turn. And it always feels like, like I just want to do the thing. Okay, I'm going to move here, but then next time it's my turn, I'm going to buy the wall, and then I'm going to move here, and then next time it's my turn, I'm going to do a thing. Now, to help with this, there are shortcut tiles. Now, these are tiles that count as adjacent, even if they're not next to each other. But the problem we found is that purely by luck, every time we have played, they end up next to each other anyway. So you're not really saving a lot of detail. Like, I almost wonder if there's a way to pull one out to put in later or something, some system to make sure they're more spread out. Now, that said, there is one item in the promo pack that will help with this, but I'll get to the expansion content a bit later. But I expect if this game goes over well, and I don't see much reason it shouldn't, then we might even be able to look forward to more expansions in the future. I know I would be excited if they were announced. Now, combat is quite fun. I described it above, but it can be highly random. Now, this randomness is greatly mitigated by getting your characters equipped as soon as possible. You want to get that helmet, that shield, that sword. Now, most of the items start off good only against set monster colors. And using that to your advantage will greatly enchant increase your odds of winning. And it's also worth upgrading as much of your equipment as you can because each upgraded piece gives you permanent dice. Whereas the basic equipment can only be used once per battle, the permanent dice are used every roll in the game. The ability to back off in the middle of a fight is also interesting because it can lead to some tactical choices, especially with that rule of only being able to use your equipment once per battle, because you could go in, start a fight, fight one round, retreat, and then you use your second action to attack again, and all your equipment will be reset. So not only fun for the family, but some real tactical thinking can mm -hmm. come into play as well. They haven't limited it and made it so kid-friendly that it becomes adult-unfriendly. Yeah, once we get into my final thoughts, that's definitely one of the things I will be bringing up, that this one's as fun for adults. Now, one thing that does set this cooperative game apart from other cooperative games we played uh, with the kids, like Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters or Disney Sidekicks, is that Avel can be quite easy to win especially with the default map and easy difficulty, the, the level one on the meteor. That said, even on the easy game levels, like the, the simplest game, it always felt tense, even though it was pretty clear we'd have to roll absolutely horribly to fail. And I think that's just because of the nature of the game with the whole build up and get ready angle. No matter how much you've done, that turn when you flip that meteor over and repopulate the board and put the, the beast out just feels tense. And then swapping to normal and hard difficulty adds two more monsters, up to two more monsters on the board. So I got to say, swipping, swapping that meteor from level one, two, three didn't do a lot to make the game feel much more difficult. Now, what does really change the difficulty is the different maps. And the main thing that amps up the difficulty is how close the beast is to the castle. In the basic game, it's three squares away. In the hard game, it's two squares away. And in the really difficult game, it's one square away. So the available dials really have significantly different impacts mm -hmm. in how they adjust the game from a, a coarse, you know, easy, medium, hard to a sort of more subtle uh, yeah. change. Now, an aspect of the game I didn't mention during my summary is that Chronicles of Avel comes with a separate booklet that includes a short story as well as descriptions of all the creatures you'll run across. Now, my youngest daughter loved the fact this was included in the game. Our first time playing, every time we pulled out a new wandering monster, she read out loud the entry for that monster. Now, once we later playing with both kids, they would actually argue over who got to read the book next and which monster and whose turn it was. And I really like the non-standard fantasy setting with many familiar creatures with their own unique twists and some really cool new types of baddies, including an entire mushroom-based faction. I mean, I think the Goombas might argue with how original mushroom factions are, but it is always great to see products like this diverge from elf, dwarf, orc, dragon material into 
that you know that so many just sort of automatically default into. I will admit there are goblins. I, I think they had to have put goblins in. Though if I remember, there's a goblin in each of the factions because they, they were the generic monster. Now, one thing I did try in regards to Avil was to play it just with adults. And I'm happy to say that while this game is aimed at kids, similar to Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, it can be just as much fun for adults. Now, we played with Tori and Kat, and Tori in particular was smitten with it. He would have bought a copy online on the spot if it was available to purchase. He loved it that much. He also thought this would be a great game his mother would enjoy, as she enjoys lighter, less thinky games, but likes engaging games with stories. Now, this leads me to say, I think not only is Chronicles of Avil a great cooperative game for playing with kids and the whole family, but it's just a great cooperative game. Though I think some might consider Tori just a big kid, but <laughs> I assume Kat agreed with him. Yes. Actually, they made that comment that night. That, 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 that uh, I don't know if it counts because we're all kind of big kids anyway. I think most gamers have at least a little bit of that in. Now, earlier I mentioned that we received Chronicles of Avil in a bundle, which included three things in addition to the main game. And I want to talk a bit about each before I share my overall thoughts. So the first was a set of stickers for the meeples. This is a nice to have, but in no way, absolutely not necessary. Um, what was neat is it did include two sets of stick stickers for each meeple, one that looked male, one that looked female. So you do get to kind of pick your gender, but you only get to do this once because these don't come off. I would have loved to have gotten another set of meeple as well, so I could just make a big box full of all the possible combinations, but I get it. They really have made some interesting choices about gender representation, though I guess most families would probably set up the copy for their, their family and mm -hmm. be okay with it. Uh, not everyone has the wide variety of playgroups or has to account for public play. Yeah, that's it. actually what it ended up doing is I, we made three females and one male. Next is the Adventurer's Toolkit. Now, this is an oddly shaped expansion. It's kind of flat and long, and it's in like a wrap instead of a box that ends up being just three punch boards and a set of rules for how to use the new stuff on them. Now, the stuff includes a new item type, boots, which have their own unique shape to, that you can feel in the bag, that give characters re-rolls at the basic level and more movement once you upgrade them. There's three new potion types. There's three new hex tiles that get mixed in with the rest and three new large monsters, which are three demonic sisters, and rules for familiars. You get the familiars by defeating the sisters. There's also 3D cardboard ballista figures, which are one of the things you can purchase on the new tiles. Now, once built, these fire at the start of each round, dealing damage to monsters on their hex or one hex away. This is actually the only way to do a ranged attack in the game, which is a cool addition. Honestly, this is a fantastic expansion that I don't see any reason you shouldn't pick up if you're picking up the core game. Like, I just recommend this one straight up. My only complaint is that this is a separate purchase. Like, to me, all of this just should have been in the main box, especially since the, the, the boots, because you can tell there's a spot for boots on your character card, and you know they pre-planned it. There was obviously designed to fit them. I think this is a really nice expansion. It's not much, but it seems like it would be too much stuff to include yeah. in the main box right off the bat and make the game just that much more difficult to handle, learn, especially for the younger audience. So it lets you get used to the game before adding in these new features. That's fair enough. Like, like most of these do break the original rules in some way. So fair, I can see it. Now, finally, we have the Heroes Treasure promo pack. Uh, this is very small. This is a little tiny promo pack, smaller than a card, that contains one punch board with three new items that you just toss into the bag and rules for using it. Now, each of these features a new shape, so it's easy to confuse with the rest of the curves in the bag. Now, there's a stone that lets you reroll green dice. Note this is something in your inventory that lets you get a reroll, which is neat. A warp crystal that you can drop on the map that connects to all the other shortcuts I mentioned earlier. So another way to spread out those shortcuts. And the gold pouch, which I just thought was so cute because it lets you stack gold on it, saving you room in your pack instead of having to spread it all out. All three of these are cool. Uh, both mechanically and just to put more stuff in the bag. So I do appreciate that. As a promo pack, it's just a nice, fun thing to have, but in no way necessary. Mm -hmm. More of a thank you for jumping on the Apple train. Now, looking at everything as a whole, I, I honestly had no idea what to expect when I review, agreed to review Chronicles of Apple. Uh, when first contacted, I, of course, did some research. I looked up the game and I'm like, oh, that art is really fantastic. And it looks like a unique 
unique world. And then I read the bag pulling inventory system. And that alone was enough to convince me to try it. I, years ago, my kids had a game called Laundry Jumble, where they had to reach into a laundry bin and pull out different types of fabric. And I was reminded of that, how much my kids love that. And I'm always looking for a game our entire family should enjoy. So while it's not that I expected the game to be bad, but I didn't expect it to be nearly as good as it actually is. I, there's no way I could have anticipated how much we would enjoy this game. Chronicles of Avil is a solid cooperative board game. Features fantastic artwork, a cool, unique fantasy setting, engaging mechanics, and excellent component quality. The bag-based equipment system is just as much fun as I hoped, and the adventures feel tense even when you're doing well. While the game may seem easy at first, which I honestly think is great for playing with younger kids, there are ways to ramp up the difficulty to challenge even experienced cooperative game players. Well, who's this game for? Who should be rushing out to grab it? And who maybe not so much? Everyone should know. Uh, if, if, you, if you're a fan of cooperative game, if you're looking for a cooperative fantasy adventure game, the entire family can enjoy together. I don't think you can go wrong with this one. This is even one I think younger, early grade school kids will be able to grasp and enjoy, yet is more than engaging enough for adults to enjoy. And that's honestly the biggest surprise to me with Chronicles of Avil is just how much fun a group of four adults had playing this game clearly marketed to families and kids. Honestly, if you're a cooperative game fan, even if you don't have kids or don't plan on playing with kids, you should check this game out. It's not only a great cooperative family game, it's just a great cooperative game. Though with adults, I do suggest jumping to at least the medium difficulty maps after your first learning game to make it more of a challenge. Now, if you don't like cooperative games at all, I don't think Chronicles of Avil is going to win you over. It has the same issues you're going to find in most cooperative games, including a big potential for quarterbacking. Um, and there's nothing really in this system at all to mitigate quarterbacking. Um, it follows the usual formula of everyone does a thing, then something bad happens. And really, except for the cool bag building mechanic, there's nothing really totally new here. You're not going to discover a brand new, you know, this isn't the first deck builder or something. Maybe it'll be the first touch and feel pull from a bad game and start a whole trend. That'd be kind of neat. But for, for experienced gamers, I don't think you're, you're missing out on anything, especially if you don't like co-op games. Now, I do have one final recommendation, one Sean mentioned earlier, and that is if you do pick up this game, if you do think of picking this game up, I strongly think it's worth getting that bundle deal where you get the expansion and the promo pack. I, and the stickers. While the game doesn't feel incomplete without them, the, everything adds to the game in a significant and rewarding way. I really think, especially the expansion, if you can only get one, go for the expansion. If you can only get two, get the, the promo pack and leave the stickers to the side. Those, they're nice to have. Well, that's it for our review of Chronicles of Avel from Rebel Studio. When you have the time, I invite you to also check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Dot com.